I do not know that for the sympathy of one living being, I would make peace with all. I have love in me, the likes of which you can scarcely imagine, and rage, the likes of which you would not believe. If I cannot satisfy the one, I will indulge the other. There is something at work in my soul which I do not understand. I looked upon the sea. It was to be my grave. I discover that grief means living with someone who is no longer there. Although I may not be yours, I can never be another's. With an anxiety that almost amounted to agony, I collected the instruments of life around me that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that I lay at my feet. It was already one in the morning. The rain pattered dismally against the panes, and my candle was nearly out, when, by the glimmer of the half-extinguished light, I saw the dull, yellow eye of the creature open. It breathed hard, and a convulsive motion agitated its limbs. Remember that I have the power. You believe yourself miserable, but I can make you so wretched that the light of day will be hateful to you. You are my creator, but I am your master. Obey. From you could I hope for succor although towards you I felt no sentiment but that of hatred. Unfeeling, a heartless creator, you had endowed me with perceptions and passions, and then cast me aboard an object for the scorn and horror of mankind. If such lovely creatures were miserable, it was less strange that I, an imperfect and solitary being, should be wretched. I do not know, said the man, what the custom of the English may be, but it is the custom of the Irish to hate villains. My present situation was one in which all voluntary thought was swallowed up and lost. But my enthusiasm was checked by my anxiety, and I appeared rather like one doomed by slavery to toil in the mines or any other unwholesome trade than an artist occupied by his favorite employment. Your mum wrote that girls can do whatever, Ada continued, education, profession. Mary, now fully engaged, put down her book. My dear Ada, my mother wrote about how things ought to be, not how they are. Ada continued looking displeased, which made Mary go on. Of course, how are things to be the way they ought, unless we make them so? I was myself when young, but that wears out in a very short time.
He told me that he had had many visions lately. He had seen the figure of himself, which met him as he walked on the terrace, and said to him, How long do you mean to be content? I seemed to have lost all soul or sensation but for this one pursuit. I busied myself to think of a story, a story to rival those which had excited us to this task, one which would speak to the mysterious fears of our nature. And awaken thrilling horror, one to make the reader dread to look around, to curdle the blood and quicken the beatings of the heart. Our husbands decide without asking our consent or having our concurrence. For to tell you the truth, I hate this boat, though I say nothing. How slowly the time passes here, encompassed as I am by frost and snow. Yet a second step is taken towards my enterprise. I have hired a vessel and am occupied in collecting my sailors. Those whom I have already engaged appear to be men on whom I can depend and are certainly possessed of dauntless courage. But I have one want, which I have never yet been able to satisfy, and the absence of the object of which I now feel as a most severe evil. I have no friend. When I am glowing with the enthusiasm of success, there will be none to participate in my joy. If I am assailed by disappointment, no one will endure to sustain me in dejection. I shall commit my thoughts to paper. It is true, but that is a poor medium for the communication of feeling. I desire the company of a man who could sympathize with me, whose eyes would reply to mine. You may deem me romantic, my dear sister, but I bitterly feel the want of a friend I have no one near me, gentle yet courageous, possessed of a cultivated as well as of a capacious mind, whose tastes are like my own. To approve or amend my plans. I am too ardent in execution and too impatient of difficulties but it is still a greater evil to me that I am self-educated. For the first 14 years of my life, I ran wild on a common and reading nothing but our Uncle Thomas's books of voyages. At that age, I became acquainted with the celebrated poets of our own country. But it was only when it had ceased to be in my power to derive its most important benefits from such a conviction that I perceived the necessity of becoming acquainted with more languages than that of my native country. Now I am 28, and I am in reality more illiterate than my schoolboys of 15. It is true that I have thought more and that my daydreams are more extended and magnificent, but they want, as the painters call it, keeping, and I greatly need a friend who would have sense enough not to despise me as romantic, and affection enough for me to endeavor to regulate my mind. Why did I not die? more miserable than man ever was before. Why did I not sink into forgetfulness and rest? Death 
snatches away many blooming children, the only hopes of their doting parents. How many brides and youthful lovers have been one day in the bloom of health and hope, and the next day a prey for worms and the decay of the tomb? Of what materials was I made that I could thus resist so many shocks which, like the turning of the wheel, continually renewed the torture. What have we left to dream about? The clouds are no longer the charioted servants of the sun, which has been weighed and measured, but not understood. We have the assemblage of the planets, the congregation of the stars, and the yet unshackled ministration of the winds. Such is the list of our ignorance. My possessions are at your service, I replied bitterly. My poverty, my exile, my disgrace, I make a free gift of them all. O expectation, what a frightful thing art thou, when kindled more by fear than hope. I feel my heart glow with an enthusiasm which elevates me to heaven, for nothing contributes so much to tranquilize the mind as a steady purpose, a point on which the soul may fix its intellectual eye. Oh, what a miserable night I passed. The cold stars shone in mockery, and the bare trees waved their branches above me. Now and then the sweet voice of a bird burst forth amidst the universal stillness. All, save I, were at rest, or in enjoyment. I, like the arch fiend, bore a hell within me, and finding myself unsympathized with, wished to tear up the trees, spread havoc and destruction around me, and then to have sat down and enjoyed the ruin. I asked, it is true, for greater treasures than a little food or rest. I required kindness and sympathy, but I did not believe myself utterly unworthy of it. Perhaps it is belief more than truth that helps us survive. There are two monsters in my story, not one. And one of them, the scientist, is indeed named Frankenstein. But in truth, neither the lonely meditations of the hermit nor the tremulous raptures of the reveler are capable of satisfying man's heart. From the one, we gather unquiet speculation. From the other, satiety. The mind flags beneath the weight of thought and droops in the heartless intercourse of those whose sole aim is amusement. There is no fruition in their vacant kindness and sharp rocks lure beneath the smiling ripples of these shallow waters. I have created something and let it loose upon the world. Whether it was my right to do so or not, I cannot say. At times, I am filled with love for my creation. At others, I am filled with regret and horror. But it is done.
it has been created.